Ira, do you want your mic on vocal <coughs> or music? Okay. Hello and welcome to Grand Illusions. My name is John Gallagher. My guest today is visual wizard Ron Cobb. Ron is the production designer of Conan the Barbarian. It's a universal release directed by John Milius. We'll be right back after these messages. We'll be right back right after these messages. We'll be right back right after these messages. He'll be right back after these messages. Ron, how did you become involved with Conan? Well, it's um, <clears throat> it's a long and possibly boring story, but um, excuse me. Um, <clears throat> um, when I finished Alien, I be uh, I was asked by Ed Pressman and Oliver Stone to to have, to have some design input into into Conan at the time, and I was already committed to John Milius to do a a mountain man movie with him called Half the Sky but I was waiting for him to get back from Europe and I told him I had this commitment so I did a series of paintings uh, in a couple weeks I think just to sort of help the project along with the Oliver Stone script and uh, sort of had a little tinge that I thought maybe I would like to be a part of that but I did have this obligation to John and I, and I was anxious to work with John so then uh, finally I finished the paintings uh, uh, they went on with their project that they went on with their Conan with Arnold of course and everything and then I went over to John Milius and started uh, a series of paintings for his Mountain Man movie, Half the Sky, The Life of Jedediah Smith, a kind of a companion piece to Jeremiah Johnson. And, um, and uh, John was very, very excited about doing this sort of Western in a sort of Conan-like style, of primitive, larger-than-life landscapes of the unknown West at the time, almost like portraying it like a science fiction movie, Finding Mars. There were even Conan elements in this uh, picture. Uh, but um, um, as, this, as he got bogged down in the Mountain Man script, uh, word got out, you know, that maybe he might be receptive once again to the Conan project. So Ed Pressman and assorted people, Ed Summer and all brought, they sort of contrived to have the script dropped on his desk. He read the Oliver Stone Conan and, uh, and uh, more or less said, well, look, I've got to do this picture. And he talked to Dino and everything. He postponed the Mountain Man picture and I was back on Conan, only this time with a new script and John, and we went on from there. But uh, to sketch in the larger background, I've known John for quite some time, ever since he saw an exhibit of mine in 1964 when I got out of the Army and saw a lot of my fantasy drawings, long before I was a cartoonist. And, and when I met him years later as a USC student and such, he was, uh, and getting into the film business, he, would, he commissioned paintings from me and always wanted me to design a picture for him, and this was the first time. So, I don't know, that's... <laughs> this is as brief as I can make it. And John Millius credits you with the visual style of the film, and obviously your interaction with him as a production designer, uh, you know, was, was very intensive. Could you speak a little bit about your your relationship or your working relationship with John Millius? Well, um, I think it's it, you know it's it's almost uh, opposites attract in the sense that I've John has been very very different from me, but we're alike in that we're. Uh, I find we get very enthusiastic and we're intensely interested in persuading people to certain views or to certain, not necessarily, I don't know that I am that much, but I like to at least have effect. I like to, uh, to uh, uh, entertain, to kind of stimulate, and John certainly does, but from almost another direction. <clears throat> and uh, uh, he was very appreciative of my vision and the th sort of things I would explore, and he, and he supported it and helped me. And, and uh, I was very, very interested in his interest in Conan, even though I was not particularly a Conan fan. Uh, there were things I could relate to personally that fascinated me. So we had a very, very good, uh, very close relationship all through the beginning, working, working, uh, throwing script ideas back and forth and visual ideas. John would sketch a little bit and I would come up with a, a plot twist, you know, that he would like. And it was, uh, it was on the picture a long, long time before it became a practical movie. And, um, Later on, as, as casting, he went off to do casting, and I became more and more involved in the practical application of designing the picture and learning a lot of it, by the way, because my experience is limited, taking on the rather awesome responsibility that John decided he would have to give me uh, to have, have my view or my vision imposed on the film. I had to have the authority, so he fought to make me production designer. and. Uh, um, but later, I think what it came right down to actually shooting the picture, then only then and only then did we realize that we did we were thinking of two different movies, you know. But that's fine; it's his movie, and um, um, and I had to kind of uh, backpedal a little bit and readjust. Uh, uh, I, I had uh, I had a different idea of perhaps where we we're going, <clears throat> but we never had any real great problems, and it uh, moved moved along very very well. 
As an artist, how did you cope with you know that incredibly arduous task of taking your illustrations and applying them to these rigorous locations in Spain? Well, I think I think more than an artist or a painter or even a cartoonist or whatever you want, I, I've always had a very strong orientation toward toward ideas, uh, design in a way. I'm a frustrated engineer, a frustrated architect, maybe even a frustrated writer. I'm not sure. <clears throat> so. Um, um, to me, I saw it as a total design problem. Find a location, make the location work, uh, design something that will fit the location and help tell the story. And I, and, and, and with emphasis on the story because that's sort of where I, my, where I saw the center of the picture was I was only telling, helping to tell the story. That's why I was interested in having an input into the script. Um, so uh, it, it was very smoothly, well, it wasn't a transition, it's sort of the kind of the way I like to think all along. If I'm, if I'm painting or drawing anything, I'm generally going into that kind of background anyhow. I'm thinking about all the other elements. So it was just nice to do it for real for a change. It was more or less like fantasizing about building such a bizarre temple, say, on the side of a mountain, or finding a frozen tundra or plateau to build the Wheel of Pain, you know. Uh, it was nice to have those elements added. They were not difficult for me. They, well, they were difficult. They were a challenge, but they were not uh, at all what I was uh, unused to thinking about. What was the most difficult scene to shoot? Well, you probably have to talk to John about that. He yeah. told me that it was, for him, the, the opening raid in the forest because of the, the, the blizzard yes, conditions. I suppose that's true, yes. I suppose that's true. From your point of view as the designer in terms of building? Um, Mm, well, it's rather uniform. Uh, everything was such a thrill for me, you know. Uh, uh, the problems came and they would come and go, and we, uh, a lot of them were obvious. Uh, uh, I can't say that there was any great, uh, great difficulty. There was, there were just nagging problems of like we never had enough s uh, stage room. Uh, there are no massive stages in Spain, uh, even with all the big pictures that have been made there. Uh, there were at one time a few, but they've been turned into tennis courts or something. So we, so uh, anyone making a big epic film in Spain at the moment has to go around and has to go through the same process of finding a big industrial building that isn't being used at the time, cover all the windows and everything. So like, uh, I would say the most annoying problem was that the, the, the Tower of Reptiles, the set of the temple inside with the snake pit and everything, and the orgy chamber, uh, apparently inside the Mountain of Power, were both enormously restricted in, in space. We, uh, I had to go to great lengths to s disguise the fact that the, we, they were very small stages. And uh, we, were, we built wall to wall. We had six inches to spare right against the wall all the way around. We had to build passageways under the sets to get people around them because you couldn't pass. <laughs> and the, uh, the circle of the temple literally was flush against the wall on each side. <laughs> And um, that was uh, frustrating and annoying because it uh, really made everything so tight and it was so difficult to, we used every square foot. If there was a little bit of space of stage left, then we'd build up a tunnel there, you know, and, and we were just climbing up and over sets and we had people working in ridiculous places, you know, casting things to get them out of the rain. And that was, I think, the biggest problem, the space. And, um, and, and indeed, the, 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 um, the village up in the mountain, we, we did have blizzard conditions, and of course, I don't know if you have heard, but uh, in the middle of the battle uh, of the um, of the attack on the village, the snow disappeared, and we had to cart in tons and tons of marble dust and cover the forest with white marble dust, simulated snow and cotton and everything we could get our hands on to uh, finish the shots. We waited for a long time for snow, and it never came again. and. Um, so um, we were just lucky we got some of the broader scenes while, while the snow was real. And then when we got right down to shooting all the battle, it's all, a lot of it is just fake, fake snow. And I don't think anyone's noticed. We're lucky. And then there was also a, a famous military coup in Spain at the time that, that you guys were over there. Yes. Did yes. that affect uh, the shooting? Not really. Not really. Just uh, we were very curious about it and everybody was constantly talking about the political situation there. and. Um, but it was it was really um, just another incident, actually one of many, uh, a little more spectacular than others. So you heard about it here, but it was it really was very evident that there was lots of ups and downs after the death of Franco. No one quite knows where Spain is going to go, <clears throat> and we, I think we're reminded of the fact that Spain 
prior to um, to the to the um, uh, Civil War um, was very much like that for hundreds and hundreds of years. It was constantly there were coup after revolution after counter revolution, etc. And it was only the uh, the uh, the the kind of um, um, holding of uh, this this enforced stability of uh, Franco that gave gave Spain this long period of apparent stability. But really, that's very uncharacteristic of the history of Spain, if you really read about it. So it looks like you're just getting back to the old Spain, where you're just going to have lots and lots of these mini coups and ups and downs. I would expect a great deal more of this chaos. In this fantasy world uh, that you created in Conan, there's a great sense of history. And I know that both you and John Milius are history buffs. And I was wondering mm. if you could talk a little bit about the historical preparation that you uh, put into the film. Well, yes, I, I uh, strangely enough, I, I wanted, I wanted, of course, to derive uh, a lot of the look of Conan, not necessarily from Frazetta or even Howard, uh, but from, from, uh, as, but as an exercise, a kind of a re um, um, creation of the process that Howard went through and in inventing sort of our own world, or at least aspects of it. I wanted to invent cultures that you've never seen before. That fascinated me more, more than anything. You might say drawing more on a kind of a applied anthropology than even applied history because we weren't going to derive it from history, <clears throat> just get hints from it. But, um, but like Howard, we realized we would have to have recognizable cultures. Um, you could always tell, well, though he would rename them, you could always tell that they're kind of Romans and Persians and Mongols and, and Vikings and all the Howard stories just with different names. And so uh, we found we had to, of course, ultimately do that because we would have to rent a lot of props and for the crowd scenes and the city scenes, and we couldn't remake everything. <clears throat> so we, so um, uh, John imposed, of course, his favorite culture, the Mongols. He wanted to see a lot of that, so I accommodated that, and we sort of did primal Mongols, you know, and tried to make them as unusual looking as possible, like the people that later became the Mongols. Um, but really it doesn't turn out that way. They're just Mongols with yurts and everything. And, um, and, uh, and certainly Viking and Nordic uh, cultures and, and the Wheel of Pain, so some of the elements are derived from uh, you know, Viking ships and things and wood carvings and totems and runes and all that. Um, but the one place where I could more or less cut loose and still be is fairly original uh, was with the cult of set, all the architecture around the cult of set. And originally, there was at one time going to be a great deal more of it, but um, I wanted to kind of come up with uh, some of the some of the gaudiness I've seen in Hindu temples in in, um, in Asia and uh, some of the uh, uh, severe stylizations of the Aztecs. Uh, certainly. Uh, the majesty of you know kind of a, a Japanese ceremonial gate as a kind of a gateway into the mountain, yet hopefully all melt it together like it so so it sort of works, and still has that emotional, that emotional uh, is characteristic of the emotional architecture of any religion, a strange almost standing sculpture, and uh, that was fun and that was the that was the only real venture into uh, attempted originality uh, that the budget would allow. How was your relationship with Dino De Laurentiis uh, on the picture? Well, they're very skeptical. I mean, he didn't. I'm John's friend, you know. What, what, what do I know, you know? So, and we rarely saw him. And uh, I think he was sort of skeptical all through the picture that I he wasn't sure whether John was right as to whether I could do it. And he was worried about how practical I might be. And and uh, um, but one thing he did do is he he uh, he gave me art directors to work with who I found were really excellent and very, very helpful, and they're very good friends of mine. But on the other hand, I, I, uh, uh, it was very gratifying to discover that I didn't, there, there was only certain practical details I needed advice on, and that the basic uh, ec aesthetic exercise of designing the look of the picture was, was appropriate and worked, and uh, I never had any problems with that. And that was, that of course was a thrill for me, and it was also a boost to my confidence. <coughs> Millius also credits you with your ingenuity in, in taking, for example, the Wheel of Pain and turning it into the Tree of Woe, using elements uh, of one prop and yeah. turning it into another. Well, yes, I suppose. I don't, although there was no, 
relationship between those the two. The center of the, of, the, of the Wheel of Pain into the Tree of Woe? Oh, there were, yes, yeah, some of the ironwork probably, but but uh, but uh, but there were many other. There are better examples of that. The uh, the uh, well, what I wanted to do was have a consistent cultural look, and if we were doing the Mongols, I tried to keep everything looking very much and very believably of that culture, so that it, even if you looked at a crowd of people, you could kind of tell the difference. Though you don't see as much of that as I thought you would, <clears throat> and when you saw the cities, you could kind of recognize Pictish people and Vanir people and all this wandering in the squares. Um, the uh, the orgy chamber, the big marble set inside that was revamped to become the kitchen. That was a quite a quite a task. We redid that using the same cave. You know the the big red kitchen that he re lit with red light, which sort of surprised me. I didn't expect that. But we that was virtually the same set with not too much change. Just a lot of natural rock surfaces added to it and breaking down some of the things. Which uh, w w interesting exercise and a lot of the. Uh, um, uh, oh, a lot of things. A lot, a lot of things that uh, uh, intrigued me about um, giving the uh, this fantasy a sort of historical period look because we we did discuss this at one time and John saw it in terms of Kurosawa, a kind of a Kurosawa film with a lot of stylization but still a, a smell and sense of grimy reality. Kurosawa was always fairly naturalistic about his sets. Uh, that's how John interpreted that. I interpreted it. I just wanted to do, I thought it would be very interesting to, to not bow to sort of MGM fantasy-like sets, but keep this thing, just almost as a sort of subtle gag, keep the, this totally imaginary world looking as believable as possible. And I thought it might be interesting to see if I could simulate reality, you know, simulate the, the, the look. That's probably why the picture lacks a lot of sorcery because we wanted to keep it more naturalistic, more like a historical story, almost as though this is the true story of the real Conan and then Howard embellished it with a lot of sorcery and magic later on, you know. But this is how, this is the true story. If anyone knows this, the, the thing in the crypt, you know, the, uh, the skeleton uh, where Conan finds the sword, in Howard's story, the skeleton gets up and fights with him and he has a sword fight, has to chop it off. Well, well it's almost as though we created the basis of that myth, you know, because uh, it fell over on him as though it were coming to life and that Howard, uh, or that Conan later told that story, embellished it, you know, as a, um, as a tall tale that he fought, you know. Um, um, this doesn't make us terribly popular with a lot of Conan purists, but, uh, but uh, it seemed important that we both of us, that we reinvent, that John find a part of Conan's life that Howard had never written about in great detail so that he could uh, uh, do an original screenplay. It seemed important that I depart as much as possible from the direct copying of Frazetta or, or, or uh, even um, some of the visual elements described in the, in the novels, just so it would have the vitality of being recreated and, and um, would have, uh, because otherwise it could, it could be very drab and very, very um, orthodox, you know, if we'd been very slavishly copied everything and been very, very careful and not to insult the purists, and it would be, it would be hard to put a lot of vitality into a picture like that. So we, we, we decided to kind of use a lot of the, um, the conventional imagery as a departure point rather than uh, copy it. John, let me just change the things. Mm -hmm. That's one of the things I really, I really love about it is that the historical. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But we are prone to nostalgia as well as history. ABC's John McKenzie has been rummaging in the past. Gallon not only collects old toys, but five days a week he puts on his own half-hour cable TV show. You might say he's trying to relive his childhood, which is nice work if you can get it. TV historian Ira Gallon is one of the few people in the country who's been able to collect some of the most precious moments of television history. He just literally tossed everything. NBC, CBS just didn't care about collecting. There are no major programs to restore TV history and even television commercials like they are for feature films. And if it's not done in the next five to ten years, we won't have that history anymore.